welcome to Subtext and Discourse, the podcast taking you behind the scenes of the art world with the unique individuals involved in the field. I'm your host, Michael Dooney. In today's episode, I'm speaking with one of Germany's most distinguished voices in contemporary photography, Jessica Backhaus. Her latest book, Cutouts, was released earlier this year through Cara Verlag and made its debut at the ICs in Arles together with her Berlin gallery, Robert Morat. Since then, Jessica has had solo presentations of the cutouts at Photo London and Photo Basel, and depending on when you're listening to this, you'll also be able to see select works from the cutouts, which will be presented by a Robert Morat Gallery at Paris Photo, in addition to the Paris Photo Aperture Photo Book Award, for which cutouts has been shortlisted. Please be sure to subscribe to Subtext and Discourse, which is available on all major podcast platforms to stay up to date. But without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Jessica Backhouse. You're living in Berlin now, mm-hmm. we said before, just over well, 10 years, 12 yeah. years you're in Berlin. Are you from Berlin? No, no, no. I'm originally, I was born in Cuxhaven. It's near Hamburg. It's all the way in the north, mm-hmm. near the North Sea. But I only lived there for two years because then with my parents being in this theater, my father a director and my mother an actress, we were always more or less on the road like oh, gypsies. Okay. Yeah. We went from town to town, wherever, whatever theater, they had an engagement or a contract. So my childhood was very, I would say, vivid and <laughs> colorful. Yeah, It was wonderful because in many ways... It was a very free upbringing where Mm. a lot of possibilities were given to you. And I also became quite independent from a very young age and artists came to our home. It was always a very open apartment and we sometimes went on tour with a theater play. And so it was um, quite, quite colorful and a very nice childhood. And then at some point, I came actually to Berlin when I was in my teenage years, like 13, 14. Then I came to Berlin, but I only actually lived here for four years because then, I don't know, I had a longing to go abroad to learn another language because I always loved traveling. I kind of got that Mm -hmm. from when we were young, we were always traveling. So I was very curious about other countries and I wanted to learn different languages. So my mother said, okay, if you want, you can go somewhere. So I actually went to France when I was 16. So I left home. (laughs) I spent two years in a boarding school in France. And then I basically decided not to come back to Germany because I really enjoyed being in France. So I spent another six years in Paris. And that's where actually I started also my studies. I studied photography and visual communications. And after I finished my studies, I was kind of 22, I felt that I didn't know anything. I don't know. I was quite green in a lot of things. And um, I wanted to make a living as a photographer. But here I was. And, you know, I didn't even know how to make a living as a photographer. Yeah. And I figured Paris at the time, you know, it's still a big city and, you know, rent, everything is quite costly and expensive. So you have to find some sort of job, how to make a living. Yeah. So what I did for two years is, and I'm telling you about that because in many ways it was really an incredible school when I look back. I um, worked for various magazines and there I worked in the art department with art directors. So when there were actually reporters or photojournalists and they went out to a country and they came back with, I don't know, 10,000 of slides, then the art director said to me, okay, you got to pick the 10 pictures to create the story. So for two years, I literally was emerged in pictures, pictures, pictures all day long, all different kind of topics. And I learned a lot. I learned what to look for to create a story. And I learned the whole art of editing, which now when I do my own projects and when I do my books, it's a really tremendous help to do this editing. So I did that for two years and I still felt 
no, I need to learn more about photography. So I figured I'm going to assist photographers to yeah. learn about all the different lightings, all the different cameras from 8 by 10 inch camera to 4 by 5 to medium format to literally in terms of lighting, whatever you can learn. But in Paris at the time, it was very difficult. So we're really talking 26 years ago. And it was tough to get a job as an assistant. And even being a female, it was not easy because the photographers, they basically wanted really somebody also to carry all oh, the course. heavy gear. Yeah. They didn't want necessarily a young girl, you know, carrying their stuff or they thought they can't be as harsh on me. But in any case, I tried, but it was very difficult. And then it's a long story, but I'm going to cut short. <laughs> I telephoned the agent from an American photographer called David LaChapelle. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, wow. And David LaChapelle, he was doing a job for French Vogue at the time in 1995. So his age needed another assistant because he works with a lot of assistants and yeah. he has a big crew. It's always like 40 people in his crew. It's almost like a film crew. And he has tons of equipment, like two loading trucks full of any equipment you can imagine. So pure luck. I got the job. But the first time when he saw me, he said to his agent, I don't want her. You can send her home. What is she going to do on my set? You know, it's hard work. I don't want her. And she was pretty brave, his agent. She said, no, no, I'm going to keep her. Yeah. So you just have to get used to her. <laughs> so what happened then, I really remember that because there were the hottest days in history of France. It was the 14th of July. It was a holiday and there were 40 degrees all the time. Even yeah. at nighttime, it was 35 degrees. Gosh. So you were going crazy because they had the biggest heat wave and we were working 22 hours a day. He was so obsessed and so passionate about his work that literally we only got to sleep two hours. And during those four days of working 22 hours, it was kind of my first assisting experience. And I thought, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is just a pure nightmare. Yeah. Because also... He was yelling at me for 22 hours and embarrassing me and saying how awful I am and that I have no clue about photography and I should go home anyway. And it was just a pure nightmare the whole time. And his first assistant, I remember he was very kind, Jake. He says, don't listen to him. Just stay close to me. And, you know, he is just the way he is. He loves his work and he's obsessed. But just don't pay attention. Anyhow, the last night when we were shooting in this castle outside of Paris was, I guess, three in the morning. And again, he was screaming and yelling. <laughs> and he called me and he says he wanted to apologize, that he oh. was very rude to me <sighs> the whole time. He's aware and he wants to say he's sorry. He told me, he says, I, I think you have no clue, really. I think you have no clue about <laughs> photography. But what I can see is you have a true passion. You love photography. And this is just your beginning. So he says, what are you going to do in Paris? In Paris, you're going to die. This is not a good place for you. You should come to New York with me. Really? <laughs> <Yes>. Wow. Well. <laughs> so and it's funny. I don't know. Since I was a little girl, I always wanted to go to New York. At some point in my life, I wanted to live in Berlin. Paris and New York. That was kind of my fantasy when I was a little girl. So I figured, why not go? I was free at the time. I just go to New York. I will see what will happen there. So I quit my job as a picture editor. I had some savings and I figured I can live in New York for three months. Mm -hmm. You know, I will kind of get by. And so David went back to New York. He then wrote me a letter for all the paperwork. Oh, for the visas and things. Yeah, yeah, all that because it's very complicated in America, all the immigration stuff. But he also told me, he says, if you come to New York, don't come for me because I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot hire you as a full-time assistant. You have to be freelance. And basically, you have to live your own life. But give it a try. So... I came and out of those three months became 14 years. <gasps> wow. Okay. And then I stayed 14 years and I kind of assisted for five years 
with all different kind of photographers. Did you still work for David LaChapelle? For longer, I worked or? a few times, but actually not that many times. I worked all few occasions. I worked with a great Dutch photographer, Dana Luxemburg, mm -hmm. who did a wonderful project some years ago, Imperial Courts. I worked with Philip Locker de Corsia a few times, and then some fashion photographers, another photographer, Francois Allard, whom I assisted. It was a wonderful time because I basically learned all different genres, all different kind of lighting systems, all different cameras. But what I realized is that I don't like to work like that at all. After five years mm -hmm. of being in this kind of interior, celebrity, fashion, advertising world, I realized this is really not something I want to yeah. do. I guess in the 90s in New York, that would have been almost like... But it was at the peak. It was thriving. It was just... There were huge budgets. I don't know. It was, it was great because I wanted to learn about the lighting and the photographers I assisted. They always had big budgets. We were flying all different places all around the world. I mean, we had really some exciting shoots. There was also this Swiss photographer I assisted, Michel Comte. Mm -hmm. I remember there was 98. He got to photograph Elizabeth Taylor. At Neverland wow. for Michael Jackson. Yeah. So, of course, you can imagine <laughs> I was 27 and you spent three days at Neverland uh, with Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. Uh, then like I don't tale. know. I mean, we had all <laughs> crazy. I mean, there are tons of these crazy stories. And yes, I, I enjoyed it very much, but I realized this is really not something I want to do. I don't want to work with a big crew. I don't want to have five assistants. I don't want to have two trucks of lighting gear and 10 different cameras. I kind of learned what I would like to do is just to have a camera, not even have any artificial lighting, maybe a tripod if necessary, and just work with the available light and work alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine it would be really one of the toughest times to be in the industry. Obviously, one of the most creative and inspiring but really, that's such a pressure cooker of deadlines and budgets and everything going on. After doing that for a few years, you would say, okay, I, I know this isn't for me now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's very particular. I enjoyed it, obviously, very much. I learned a lot, but I couldn't see myself making a living like that. Mm. A lot of it was make-believe, you know, the whole fashion. And, the, and also, it's maybe more in America. Everything is like grand and to show but i was missing the the depths of creating something and these stories these assignments they they come and go mm. they vanish and then it's the next on it's always the next it's like who what the, and i thought who how tiring in in many ways as well and i don't know i couldn't see myself in that environment yeah so I kind of made a clean cut when I was 30. I assisted from 25 to 30. Now what? Because mm -hmm. here I was, I was 30 years old. How am I going to make a living? I mean, because New York is like Paris. You got to make a living somehow to pay the rent. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of a challenging time because it was a time when I was um, soul searching. Mm -hmm. And then I ask myself really this question, what it is I want to do with photography. And I knew that actually what my dream would be is to make books and exhibitions. That was kind of what I wanted to do, where I'm completely, I can decide what I want to do. I can work more or less on long-term projects. And ideally, I have a book published and an exhibition. But I also knew that's kind of the really hard way mm -hmm. because you don't have any guarantee for anything. No. And it's a really long road. And on that road, I could write a book alone about how many rejections I got. Yeah. You know, you really have to develop a thick skin to deal and accept all these rejections. But in any case, I kind of was then determined that that's what I want to do. So I was in a way relieved because now I knew exactly what I wanted and I had a focus. And during that time, that was then 2000, 2001, 
my mother, she bought an old farmhouse in Poland. It was completely a ruin. And then for a year, she restored it. So we spent lots of time whenever I came to Europe to visit. We spent lots of time in Poland in, mm -hmm. in that small village. And I was kind of fascinated by the village, by the people. We, we were becoming close. We were really integrated in that Polish community. It was wonderful. It was a whole new world that we were discovering and a new culture, new people. And, uh, and it was in a very big contrast to my life that I had in New York. Absolutely. I mean, like a Polish, Polish village Rockers, in yeah. the middle of nowhere and then being in New York. And I was fascinated also by how the people live, you know, in the countryside. And I don't know, there was something that I figured I want to do a project about that. Mm -hmm. And because I was a little shy, I didn't dare to ask anybody to take their portrait. So I figured I'm just going to ask if I can take their interiors, okay. making interior photos of their living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, making still lives of certain details that I was attracted to and see where that gets me. So I did that for a year or two. And the good thing was that I did this project over four years. So I kind of went back and forth between New York and Poland. And uh, because I had this distance and there was a large time in between my, my shooting, I went to the dark room in New York. I always had a particular dark room where I did all my contact sheets. I did all my printing. Mm -hmm. So I really had um, a good amount of time with the work that I did there. And I could see what I was missing, what I'm not getting, what I should pay more attention to. So each time then when I went back and forth, I also, I decided I make prints and I give them to all the people oh, nice. where I photographed. So then they were like amazed to see these pictures and were really, I guess, impressed or they had never seen their home in, in that way. And they were really, I don't know, they were enchanted. And in that way, that was kind of my luck because then the people that I started photographing, I mean, in the houses in our village, they said afterwards, oh, my grandmother, my uncle, my brother, they live in that village, in that village. And within the four years, I worked in a radius, I don't know, but I, I ended up working in 14, I guess, 14 different villages. Wow. And I had access to all different apartments, houses, and they were all welcoming me. And I figured after two years doing that, I can't do the project just without the, I mean, I can't do it just only the interiors and still lives. Mm -hmm. I really felt I need to show the people yeah. and make portraits as well. And that was um, challenging because I don't think it's something easy to do. Had you done portraits when you were working in New York? Yeah, yeah, well, commercial work, assignment yeah. work. <laughs> so I knew, but, you know, I had certain expectations. And I don't know, I was always nervous when I had to photograph somebody. Mm -hmm. And it was good because, I mean, they were very nervous too. So I explained to them that I'm as vulnerable as nervous. And then, I don't know, they really also trusted me. There was, and it, and it was not intimidating. It was just me and the camera. Yeah. And they know me and I don't know. Yeah. So I did the portraits as well. And here I was then I had four years of work and then I had to start the editing process mm -hmm. because obviously my fantasy and my big dream was to do a book. Yeah. And a friend of mine, she was always there, also a photographer, and she was always in the dark room with me. One day she says, why don't you go to Frankfurt, to that book fair? There are all the publishers from all over the world. Why mm -hmm. don't you show your work there? And, and she says, on top of it, you're German. <laughs> you know, you speak the language. Yeah. You can meet American publishers. You can meet German publishers. You can meet even French publishers mm. and, and see if anybody shows any interest. So but, you had a book dummy that you took with you? Or? Yes, because I didn't want to go just with a box of prints, completely unknown. Mm -hmm. Also, I had no concept of what a book fair was. 
I didn't know that people are there to sell their books. And it's not probably the best place where you can show your work because people have no time to see some random work, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I was very naive and I had no clue. So I had a dummy made and I had a very particular dummy made because I produced this clamshell box with porcelain, Polish porcelain and sugar and a spoon. Oh, wow. So it was a whole elaborate big collector's edition because, yes, I also yeah. had in mind I want to do a collector's edition <laughs> that is a little bit crazy and eclectic. And I had the whole box wrapped in a Polish plastic tablecloth and... Yeah, I went all the way. And so in the fall of 2004, I did travel to Frankfurt. I had a little trolley with me and I was quite impressed because, of course, I've never been to Frankfurt to the book fair and it's gigantic. Yeah, well, I know the convention center from going to Light and Building and it's a huge trade fair. And I, I know of the book fair. I mean, I've been to the lighting one, but I know how big the halls are. and. It's enormous. Yeah. So I was very intimidated because also I, I had no appointment with nobody. It, what I did have, I had a list of 50 publishers that I was interested in, that I made my research, but no appointment. <laughs> so I just figured I start down my list. And so what followed, there were these five crazy days from morning till night doing my presentations. I don't know how I did it. I would never in the world be able to do it again. But I did see 48 publishers. Wow. In those five days, in 50 hours. That's amazing. It, it was insane. The whole thing was insane. And 47 times people said, oh, interesting project, Poland, the Polish country said, okay, but who are you? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> why and you know they said oh it's interesting but you know we cannot take a chance you should first do your exhibitions and if you're becoming more successful then we will do your books oh, okay. so 47 times I heard no no we're not interested great work but not interested I mean for me it was quite interesting to see the different reactions. I was happy that people responded to the work. Mm. But of course, creating a book, producing a book, it involves a lot of money. And, you know, I was completely unknown. And it's quite different, I think, from the work that you were doing as a commercial photographer. You're, oh, yeah. Instead of going and getting assignments, helping somebody else facilitate their vision, whereas the book is your project. You know, you poured your heart into this and then... yeah. You're taking your vision and your project to the publishers to try to sell it to them. So you're kind of on the other side of it now, instead of, kind <laughs> yes. of helping you're like the person going, this is it. Yes. What do you think? I also made a pact with myself. Before I went to Frankfurt, I figured if I find a publisher and if somebody is maybe interested in my work and I get the book done, if then a book is published and if I see people are interested, I will continue to be a photographer. Mm -hmm. But if I can't find a publisher and if nobody cares, I was ready to quit photography. Really? Completely? Yeah. Because I thought I didn't know then what other options I would have. Oh, okay. I mean, I would have maybe end up being an art director or maybe go into curating shows, mm -hmm. even though I've never done it, but I could imagine it's something that I'm very interested in. Yeah, so I made a pact and I kind of knew if this is not going to work out, I maybe have to quit, even though I didn't want to quit, of course. I, all I wanted since I was 18 is just doing photography, you know? Yeah. So in any case, I guess I was able to do this craziness of Frankfurt because I had this, well, it was this passion that mm -hmm. I didn't want to quit. And so... The last publisher that I got to see on a Sunday was the publisher Klaus Kera, mm -hmm. who has a publishing house in Heidelberg. And I went to see him. I got the last appointment, but I also didn't expect anything. I, I was kind of emotionally and physically completely drained and exhausted because he was forty-eight, number forty-eight. He was number forty-eight. Wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like you have to tell the same story over and over and you have to say it like almost you have never told it to anybody. You have to be fresh. It's like a performance, yeah. like an actor. Yeah, so I didn't really expect anything. I was kind of very mellow and, you know, I showed him the work and he says, oh, let's just first talk and see who you are because it's good to know a little bit about you. And then he looked at the dummy and he liked it, but he couldn't make up his mind. He says, I like this, but I I don't know. It's it's quite a intense project. I maybe need to ask a friend of mine to have a look at it, to give me his advice, because mm -hmm. I can't make up my mind. I was like, okay. Better than a no. <laughs> <laughs> Better than a no. <laughs> so he called his friend. He's a man who at the time was working for a distribution company for books. He was from Switzerland. And he kind of flipped very exhausted and nonchalant. He kind of flipped through the book and it lasted not even a minute or two minutes and he wanted to leave. I was like, oh, that's not a good sign. But I was used to that. I was like, okay. And then he, the publisher said, well, what do you think? I mean, is it something worth doing? Should I do this book? And he says, well, you know, It's obviously a big risk because she's not known, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a great project. And he says, I don't know how he said it. He says, well, it, it, it is a risk doing this book, but the biggest risk would be if you don't do the book. You should really do this book. Oh, okay. I kind of felt at that moment like <laughs> in a fairy tale <laughs> because I was like, Can that be true? I mean, I really didn't expect it at all. And so a few minutes later, they talked a little bit on their own. And then the three of us, we made a handshake and said, we're going to do it. And you can do the book as you wish. We do also the collector's edition with the Polish porcelain. We can even wrap the trade edition in a Polish tablecloth. We do as you want. Wow. And... It really was, yeah, it sounds so cliche. It was so, but um, it was a dream come true. Yeah. In many ways it was. So for the next months, then we all, you know, prepared and worked on the editing and we did another edit because the book dummy I made mm -hmm. had 100, I can't remember exactly, 190 images wow. because I had, before I had 380, then I made, edit it down to 190. And then when I went to Heidelberg to do the final edit, we edited it down to 94 images. But it was a great process, the whole bookmaking, which obviously I had no idea. And also I had no idea what followed, the impact a book can have. And I must say it was 2005 that the book came out, so 16 years ago. It was obviously a different time and a different market to bring out photography books. Yeah. Now it's like everybody is publishing. Everybody is doing a book all the time yeah. and the, the whole market, everything has changed. Well, and it's a lot easier now, I think. Like self-publishing exists and there's a lot more exactly. avenues to make a book. Exactly. Which in a way I think is good. Yeah. So I just was so happy that I had this book then. And what I didn't know is that a book travels in a much different way than an exhibition. Yeah. Exhibitions, they come and go. You know, they have this, it's ephemer, like the yes, yeah, they're e ephemeral. character, exactly. And a book, it always stays. And that's the magic about it. And also what I love about books, the books tell the whole story. In exhibition, you get a glimpse. You know, you always select, or well, hopefully, kind of the best of, and you get a you get an idea, but you never get the whole full grip of the whole project. And I, I just think they're fascinating objects, books. So I don't know what happened then. Is that the book traveled? It traveled far more than I could have imagined. I also can really say that it changed my life. Yeah. That book changed my life. And because of, as I just said, when it then traveled, I don't know, all of a sudden doors were just popping open. Galleries were approaching me. Collectors were approaching me. Curators. I don't know. 
it, it just all changed. Wow. Were you nervous about doing the project after that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. To have such a resonance with that one project. Were people expecting a lot out of the next books? Oh, this one's so perfect, the way that everything's come together. Were you, I guess, a bit nervous about what do I do next? How can I match this or yeah. make something better? No, there was definitely that kind of nervousness or fear or pressure because I didn't expect that success. And like you said, I mean, you know, when you've done something so successful and people respond so well to it, everybody, of course, is wondering what will happen next. And it was your first book. And it was the first one. So people can say, oh, beginner's luck and now we will never hear about her again. Or what can she deliver now? Mm. What I decided fairly early on is that I didn't want to do portraits anymore. I enjoyed it, but it was very intense. I needed a break. I needed a break from the portraits, which has been a long break because only now I'm having the desire again yeah. strongly to do portraits. So I decided just stay in the world of my still lives, more or less. And I also made a decision that I didn't want to be attached just to one country. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have the freedom to do the work wherever I am, which is also more challenging because you need to find nevertheless a red thread in, mm -hmm. in what are you working on. This thing is then three years later, actually, instead of coming out with one follow-up project, I had two books at the same time, yeah. which is kind of insane that that happened. It's like two books at the same time. The second project I did is called What Still Remains. It's a project about, uh, there's a perfect German word. I still don't know the, the good translation in English, Vergänglichkeit. Yeah, I don't know, actually. Vergänglichkeit. It's about the passage of time when things vanish mm. and what stays behind. So I did a whole project of still lives, mainly all again in color. And at the same time, when we knew we would do the book in 2008, I, um, when I was in Paris and I was a student, I became friends with the photographer Giselle Freund, mm -hmm. who was a quite iconic figure in the history of photography. And um, when I met her, she was 84. I was 22. How did you meet her? Well, in 92, I met her on the 5th of November, 92. Each two years in Paris, there had been these uh, months of photography. So mm -hmm. lots of exhibitions, talks. And a friend of mine called me up and he says, oh, there's a talk about copyrights for photographers. You should go. So I went. I was mm -hmm. interested. And there were a lot of quite well-known photojournalists, a lot of the photographers from the agency from Magnum. Mm -hmm. And there happened to be Giselle Freund. Doing my studies, I had to read one of her books called Photographie et Société. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was quite intrigued by this book. And then afterwards, when I was 18, I did more research and I realized what a grand dame de la photographie she is. I didn't realize either. And I think it's really sad because uh, you mentioned Magnum and I think she had a... She involved. was one of the first women also yeah. being part of Magnum. She, I think she was the first, but then because of something in the 50s with America and communism. Yeah, they, McCarthy era, yeah. Yeah, and then they excommunicated her because they said, well, you're exactly or a communist. Mm -hmm. But she's not really renowned the same way that Cartier Bresson and Robert Kaffer and of those course. Other, other men are. Yes, even though they were very close. I mean, Henri Cartier Bresson was one of her closest friends. Yeah. I mean... It's interesting, but she, she took also quite a different path in her life. She has quite an extraordinary biography. So when there was this talk, I don't know, I was getting really nervous and I thought I really would love to talk to her, but, you know, I didn't know how to approach her. And after the talk was over, there was a buffet and uh, she was very um, surrounded by tons of people. I can imagine. And there was this American journalist who jumped on the occasion and grabbed her and wanted to have an interview with her. 
And I kind of just went with this American journalist <laughs> and just, you know, tried to listen to the interview. And I was standing quite close to her because it was packed, packed, packed. At some point, there was a pause and I figured, okay, the interview's over. I had no clue what I'm going to say. In the end, I said something very, very basic. I'm a photography student. <laughs> I admire your work. I'm also from Berlin and I study here mm -hmm. in Paris. I mean, it really was ridiculous, but okay. I approached her and, and she listened to me very kind, but I said it all in French. And then she nodded, acknowledged it, and turned away again uh -huh. because, you know, wasn't interested. She continued the interview and then she stopped and she says to the interviewer, did you just hear the young woman speaking to me? She spoke to me in French, but she's German and her French was impeccable. It's very interesting. She stopped the whole interview, started a conversation <laughs> with me again and said, you know, Now is not a good time, but I really would like to know who you are and get to know you. Why don't you come and here's my number. It's interesting because she never knew her own personal telephone number, but just very elegantly, she pulled up this piece of cardboard mm -hmm. scribbled, you know, with her telephone number scribbled on. She handed it to me. She says, call me. We have a tea. Yeah. And yeah. there it was. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. It seemed like a miracle to me. And then a few weeks later, I, I did call her and we spent our first afternoon, we spent five hours together just talking in mm -hmm. French, in English, in German. And I had lots of questions. She was also very curious about who I was, my life. And yeah, it was then eight o'clock already. And she says, ah, it's eight o'clock. I really want to watch the news Every night I'm going to have a little whiskey and you can join me because it's important to know what's going on in the world. Because at her age, 84, she was still able to read Le Monde, mm -hmm. American newspapers. She was very actively involved. She knew mm -hmm. what was going on. So we watched the news. After that, I, I left and she says, I really think you should come back. I really want that we see each other again. And then, you know, we became actually quite close friends. She became like my grandmother, my mentor. Yeah. We could speak about anything. Sometimes when she had exhibitions abroad, she took me as her personal assistant. Yeah. So we traveled together. And I always will remember when she turned 85, she had a friend that was a journalist for Le Monde. And she arranged that the whole Louvre is closed and she will have a private tour in the Louvre with nobody. Wow. And that was so sensational. And I said, oh, this is wonderful, Giselle. And she says, no, but you know what is great? You come with me <sighs> because when you will have the Louvre to your own, I mean, when there is nobody. Yeah. So one day we went. There was also another writer. And I remember there was, he was, he went with another little group, but there was still also the filmmaker, Louis Mal. It was really surreal to be in the whole Louvre when there's nobody. Yeah. It was, I mean, what I remember apart being so in awe of, of seeing these paintings in such a way that normally you don't get to see it. But what I remember is the silence. And then the footsteps, you know, they were echoing and it was just a magical moment. And we did lots of incredible things with Giselle up until she died. She passed away in March 2000. Uh, we were very close. And um, at some point or many times, actually, she also asked me, can I see your work? I want to see your work. I said, no, no, mm -hmm. I can't show you anything. <laughs> I was basically terrified yeah. of showing her any work because I figured it's like, here's the grand actress, I don't know, Greta Garbo, who's asking a young actress, oh, show me what you can do. Yeah. <laughs> And I, 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 I wasn't ready to get her critique because she really could critique in a really powerful way. And I was too scared that she would rip my work apart. 
So I think after some years, I showed her one or two pictures and we talked about it, but she was actually quite frustrated. Anyhow, and that's when I knew in 2008, she would have been 100 years old. Oh. Because she died in 2000. She was 92. Mm -hmm. In 2008, she would have been 100. And I figured, now I will show her my work. Mm -hmm. Now I'm ready. And I, I decided to do a whole book mm -hmm. dedicated to her. Yeah. And I spoke to her family, her nephew, who lives in Canada. And I ask him if that's okay. And he says, oh, of course. I think my aunt would be delighted. If you need any material, you know, from Giselle, let us know. But it's a beautiful idea. And so I made a book at the same time at the What Still Remains called One Day in November mm -hmm. because I met her one day in November. And at the beginning, I didn't know what to put in this book. Because now the pressure was on, I'm making a book for Giselle's 100th yeah. birthday. So I went to Paris. I thought, that's where I'm going to get the best material. I went to all the places that had a meaning to her, to me. I thought about our friendship. And I was, you know, for weeks taking pictures, pictures, and pictures. And I got back to New York, and they were no good. I didn't like them. They were really bad pictures. They didn't... They had no expression. They had no soul. And and I was really, I didn't know how to approach it. And I ended up speaking to a friend of mine. And she says, you know, you're taking yourself way too serious. Just remember the good times, the conversations, and just do your photography. Do what you love, where your heart takes you. And then you make a book. Yeah. But don't make it so serious, you know, it just let go of all this. And I thought it was a great advice. And that's why we ended up doing in the fall of 2008, we did two books. And I don't know, I guess I got lucky too, because people really responded to the works. And again, more galleries came, more collectors. I guess I was very fortunate that also with the follow-up projects, people kind of responded to my work. Yeah. Actually, you don't know if people will respond to it or not. And then later on, when I continue to do books and exhibitions, what I realized is some people will really enjoy the work and some people will love it. Some people find it fascinating, but a lot of people also, you know, they don't care. They find it boring. They don't respond to it. And it's natural. It's how it is. Yeah. Well, I think like with any kind of artistic expression, some people like certain music and it means a lot to them and to other people take it or leave it. Yeah. Exactly. Photography is the same. Yeah. It's exactly the same. So you also have to really liberate yourself from all this anticipation and what people think. People think all sorts of things. So you just got to liberate yourself. And I remember... Early on, I got a great advice from a friend and he, he was older and he was in the art world and he was the director of the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt and of other museums. So he was really like a monstre sacré and he really worked with the most incredible artist. And he told me, you know, you should really not pay too much attention to what the art market, what the art world of what is in, what is out. And he says, it's all this circus around. It's like all this extra noise. He said, you should really just concentrate on what you want to do. And when he discovered Jesus and the cherries, because he discovered me through Jesus and the cherries, I had a work and my first exhibition in Frankfurt and he wrote me a letter and saying that he n didn't know me, but he was quite fascinated by the work and he wanted to know who I am. And if next time I'm in Europe, I should contact him. And so we ended up meeting and we had a long dinner for five hours. It was very intense because we kind of connected mm -hmm. in a very strong way and we we talked in a very open manner, and he also asked me that question, what are you going to do next? Because you, this is so successful, it's so powerful project, and I couldn't answer. I said, I have no idea. 
I, I'm a little bit afraid of what to do next. And he says, oh, I guess it's normal. But he told me, don't worry. You just think and see what you want to do. And he said, when you realize that your heart starts beating again, then you know you're on the good road. Yeah. So just trust your heart and what you want to do and don't pay too much attention to all these things that are part of it. Mm -hmm. It's like all these prizes or awards. He says, in a way, it doesn't mean anything. What really matters is the work, the work you create. And, and he says, If you have chosen this way, it's not a marathon. You know, you, it's a life mm -hmm. you, you have chosen to live. So he gave me wonderful advice. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very also grateful. He also is unfortunately no longer alive. But um, the fact that I met him and that I had the friendship with Giselle, there were really two people who have influenced me and they're still somehow, <laughs> you know, close to me. I did another book then, One Still and Forever. Mm -hmm. That's the book I did when I had a major change in my life because after 14 years living in New York and eight years in Paris before, so I kind of decided to leave New York. I was missing Europe and I wanted to come back. So after 22 years been gone, I kind of decided to come back to Berlin and obviously everything has changed. I mean, at the time when I left, I was 16. Yeah. I came back, I was 38, you know, also those years. I mean, the years in Paris as well, but particularly the years I spent in New York from 24 to 38. I mean, so many things happened in those years. Yeah. And even though... I left New York 12 years ago, but so many things that I learned in that remarkable city, there's New York is still part of mm -hmm. me, of, of who I am. Well, I think in that period as well is when we find out who we are throughout our 20s and 30s. We're yes. Not, we're not yes. with our parents anymore. We have to we're find free. out things on our own. Yeah. That whole period for you was in New York. Yeah. It, it was a very important time. I mean, it resonates still so much inside me. And uh, when I kind of, you know, came back to Europe and back to Berlin, of course, everything had changed. I mm -hmm. mean, and I must say, even the first two years I was here in Berlin, I couldn't comprehend that I was living in Germany. Yeah, how was it moving back? Because I wondered oh, this it was, myself. It was hard. I mean, I had such a strong desire, but then being here, You realize mm. you're living in Germany. Yeah. It, I, I couldn't believe that I was living again in the country where I'm coming from. And I felt like a complete stranger. That's what I worry about with myself. I think eventually I'll go back to Australia. But because I've lived away for so long. So long. I'm not from here. But then when I go back, I've been away for so long that I'm not from there anymore either. So you've gone through that process. Did it take a while to readjust and mm -hmm. kind of settle back into your homeland? Mm -hmm. It's exactly that because when I went back to New York, the minute you leave New York, you're gone. You yeah. know, it's the the spirit of the city. You come and go. It's how it is. So I I went back to New York, even though it's the city I'm the most familiar with. But I felt very early on, even the first year of living in Germany, but going back, I felt like I'm a stranger. Wow. And here I felt like a complete alien. I guess for a year and a half, I felt I'm floating. In, in a no man's land. I didn't feel I belong anywhere. It took me really some time to adjust, even though I had some good old friends in Germany and my family here. So I came in very good conditions and I got very lucky also with the place where I'm living. But it took me some time because, yeah, I didn't know where I belong. And so the book I made, One Still and Forever, is about that process, is mm -hmm. about those emotions and those feelings exactly that you just described that yeah. maybe one day will happen to you when you go back to Australia. And I needed to comprehend and I wanted to document visually how I feel and what I'm going through. Mm. And the book, One Still and Forever, is about that. Oh, okay, yeah. So in, in during that time, 2012, so almost 10 years ago, 
Jean-Christophe Aman, who I was mentioning before, because he knew my work from the beginning. But in 2012, or even before, I'm sorry, even when I did What Still Remains in One Day November, already in 2008, he said, maybe it will not make sense to you what I'm telling you now, but I promise you, I really can sense one day you're going to end up in a complete abstraction. I know you don't see that because right now you're doing your still life. It's very figurative. Mm -hmm. It's what it is, but you will end up in the abstract world. And of course, at the time, I couldn't see that and I couldn't understand. And now I so wish, you know, <laughs> I could speak with him yeah. and show him my work because already... 13 years ago, he knew better than me where I'm going to end up. Yeah, And I think the turning point then is six degrees of freedom because after One Still and Forever in 2012 till 2015, so for three years, then I worked on yeah six degrees of freedom. That was a project very, very close to me. I mean, all my projects in some way are personal, mm -hmm. but that project, yeah, it, it had to do, it was in, well, not inspired, but it was close to my own biography. It, it's a project about identity, about roots, where we come from. And so that project, yeah, I developed for three years and you can see that is already the departure more and more of going mm -hmm. in an abstract way. Six Degrees of Freedom is kind of my old world and the new world, but there's already the departure. Yeah. And I think during that time, six, seven years ago, what I was doing for me, I don't know, I can't say it was not enough, but... I guess deep inside me, I was longing for something else, for other ways of expressing myself within the medium mm -hmm. of photography. Yeah. I couldn't see myself continuing what I've been doing with all the different projects from Jesus and the Cherries leading up until Six Degrees of Freedom. I couldn't see myself only staying in that area. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to explore and, and see what else you can do because I think photography is a medium where there's so much to do. It's, I, I find it fascinating. It's, it's a fascinating medium, but um, I needed a new road. I think as well, thinking about the works and especially hearing your insights, they were also quite emotionally heavy a lot of your earlier projects and that could be a lot of the reason why people really connect with them because although it is a still life or a room or a space they're so charged with the feeling as you took the photo and other people can respond to that they're long-term projects so this is sort of three or four years in that headspace mm. that's also tiring yeah and it's also in the end emotions or themes that i'm dealing in within my books that resonate with all of us. Mm -hmm. We all have a story to tell. We all have, you know, things that move us, that touch us, that we are afraid of. All these emotions, I think, that come up in my projects are universal, that mm -hmm. all of us have felt or we're feeling at some point in our life. And it's true what you're saying. After Six Degrees of Freedom, I was wiped out. Those three years of working on that particular project I literally didn't know. I knew I wanted to do something new, but I had no clue. I, I, I needed a break. And I remember that time. I was thinking a lot about emptiness, about feeling empty, what it means, and, and stillness when there's nothing, or we think there's nothing, or how we can be, or, you know, be afraid of when there's nothing, the emptiness, the void. Mm -hmm. We're all terrified by the void when there's nothing. But in a way, at that time, I embraced it because I couldn't relate to anything else. I needed that kind of void and where almost nothing is happening. And that's when, I mean, I didn't know 
that the trilogy would end up being a trilogy, but it turned out then to be a trilogy where I'm having three series. But the first series of that project is called Beyond Blue. And basically, it's a series where I'm just photographing a threat staged against a colored background. And even though it's so reduced and so minimal, but at the time, that's all I could focus on and that's all I could do. Mm -hmm. Even though it was so nothing, for me, it meant everything. And I don't know, I got a lot of strengths and also a joy out of it because I felt it's a liberation. And I remember when I first showed them to Robert, mm -hmm. he was like, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a string, okay. I is that the work? I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's the work. He says, but that's very daring. I mean, a string? I'm like, yes, it's one part of the series. I mean, even the publisher, I mean, the reactions I got to the first people I always show my work, they were like, hmm. I mean, they were a little bit, I don't want to say confused, but they were wondering. Yeah. And I think it's mm, not everybody, you know, resonates with that theory. It is very radical, but in the end, they accepted it. They mm -hmm. said, yes, <laughs> why not? But it took some time, you know, to get there. At that time also, I had for the first time in my life, I had a, a workspace, like a, I had a small studio. At the beginning also, I didn't know what I'm going to end up in the studio because my work, I... I yeah, you're always out and about. And out and about, yeah. you know, what am I going to do in this one room? And, you know, I was in that studio and uh, in a way, I had a certain stage fright for my own creativity. Mm -hmm. because I thought, okay, I've done the series with this thread, but obviously I'm always looking to move further. Yeah. You know, you I'm doing... repeat yourself. Yeah. No, I, I, I hate repeating myself. I mean, of course, I think in each work, old on, I mean, there's always a part of you that maybe people can recognize and to a certain extent you are having elements from, from previous works. But... I can't do just always the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, hmm, how and how can I explore? And I remember one day being so terrified of being alone with my own creativity and, and wondering what comes out of me. I don't know. Just one day I took old pictures from my archive that never ended up being in a book, but that I still thought valuable. And I don't know, I just pasted them on some aquarelle paper. Mm -hmm. And then I can't even really describe it other than in a very organic way. I added some other elements, some found material, and I ended up doing some collage work, which I never would have guessed that one day I would end up doing that. And uh, it was just marvelous. I really, at that time, when I had the first collage, I kind of really sensed I'm onto something new. Yeah. And at that point, really, my heart was beating again. And I remembered the words from Jean Christophe, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to go down that road, explore and see where it leads me. So that is actually the last part of the trilogy, The New Horizon. And in between, we have a series that has still elements from the old, my old photography, if you can say it that mm -hmm. way, and some elements from the new. That's yeah. why I'm calling it Shifting Clouds. Uh, okay, yeah. But in general, the trilogy was definitely, um, I don't know, for me, it was a liberation. Yeah. It was a liberation and uh, it was interesting to see, you know, some people really were excited about the new turns, the new corners I took and they really followed and some people didn't follow. They wanted more the old, yeah, me the, my old the work. And the classics and yeah, yes. that style. Yeah. But, you know, that's okay. That's how it is. And 
I just think it's so, I mean, I'm talking for myself, but I just, I really love exploring and experimenting and looking for new ways of expressing. Yeah. I find that quite an exciting process. And I suppose as an artist, I guess it's a natural evolution that you want to take risks, you want to try new things. And thinking again about your earlier work, because they were so emotional, the books and the projects were almost a way of dealing with those emotions. And once that's closed and that's finished, I don't want to dig them up again and go back to them. Like I've, I've handled that and that's, you know, I found my peace with that part of me. Let's start something new. So true. And I think also a trilogy and now the brand new work, Cutouts, they are emotional in a way, but in a different way. Yeah. I'm keeping a little bit my distance. I mean, they're, while well, I've created them, so yes, I consider them part of, of me, but they're emotional, but they're more distant. They are. And when I was looking at them before I came over, I thought, it feels like your work, but it doesn't look like your work, which is really <laughs> like, <laughs> that is funny. That is it's, it's great. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. I don't know. I was just thinking, like, it's, it makes sense that you've produced it. But I thought if you looked at them side by side, you're like, no, this isn't from the same person. But no. Then it is. That, I mean, if I look back at Jesus and the Cherries, that is for me so old. And I look at cutouts, you know, like, I mean, the eight books I did with Kara in the time of 16, well, 17 years, you would never guess that the person who did Jesus and the Cherries is the same person who did cutouts. Yeah. But then if you follow the whole evolution, it does make yes. sense. Yeah, I think that was the thing. I kind of had the, the step back, look at everything, and then you can see it. But, you know, not yeah. everybody follows every step no. of the way what you do. <laughs> Some people start maybe paying attention to your work now. Some people follow from the beginning, but who knows when somebody jumps yeah. on the train. You just have to create the work that I guess you believe is allowing you to stay true to yourself, regardless of what it is. Yeah. Well, when you were saying about the string, I thought about, when you were talking about the time in New York and that after having the big trucks filled with equipment and all of the crew and everything there, that you decided, look, I just want to pare it down and I'll just have my camera and I can go to where I want to go and take a photograph. And the String Beyond Blue series was almost like, I've seen enough spaces and people and objects, I just want to trim it all down to the to its most basic to a parts, simple as thread. simple as parts, yeah. And then you've sort of gone from that back into it. The other thing I thought was interesting with the cutouts, and there is some overlap with trilogy, but it's the first time that you've you've created what you photographed. Whereas most times you're like noticing things and discovering things and highlighting something, which photography classically does. It says, look at this. Whereas with the cutouts, you're very intentional in what you've produced. So you're almost making an artwork and then capturing the artwork or freezing it with a photograph rather than pointing out something like a play of light or shadow or something like that. Like, How did you decide then that, okay, this is the next stage that I'll continue with? Because the trilogy was almost like, I'll just play, I'll experiment, I'll just explore these paths and I'll see where it takes me. Like what was the maybe the next thing or what was the catalyst from the trilogy that fed into the cutouts? Hmm. Well, because I end the trilogy with the um, New Horizon series, of course, it was the first step I took into the field of collage. I mm -hmm. mean, collage have been made for decades and generations. People have explored the art of, of the collage and I find it fascinating. And there are so many artists, everybody deals with it in a different way. So when I finished New Horizon, I felt I needed to explore more the collage work. What can I do? And I used always, as I explained earlier, 
the first step was a photograph from my archive that was the base, that was the starting point. And then I added the mm -hmm. other elements, also some tape, some transparent paper and some found material. And I figured I wanted everything that I have actually created. So the first step I did, I went back into my archive and I took old, old photographs that some, well, the majority, nobody has seen because I make tons of work prints. I always spend lots of hours in the dark room. I mean, something that years ago you would tell me I would cut my own photographs, I would have told you, <laughs> you yeah. are crazy. I will never touch my photographs. But here I was cutting and taking different elements from a photograph and cutting. And But again, it was more abstract. It mm -hmm. was more like color fields, like a particular blue. I, I, I was cutting also as I went along. I mean, however organic, fluid the shape was, I was cutting mountains and mountains of these photographs. So I had, from my own old photographs, I had all these cutouts mm -hmm. and I was combining them with new work I was producing over the last few years and I've developed a whole series where I'm going to continue to do the collage this time only with elements from my own work maybe adding some colored transparent paper because I'm fascinated with this transparent colored paper but even though they will be created organically and manually i guess that's also what i like photography is something so technical so i love about the collage work that you cut and paste mm -hmm. i mean it's a little bit you use scissors i mean it sounds very basic but it's something i don't know i enjoy to work with my hands and not doing something so technical in mm. all this digital world, you know, we're living in. And so I want to explore, I want to continue this series, even though they will be collage, but I want to take them out of this context, re-photograph them, and then maybe make them larger. But in any case, that's still what I'm doing work in progress for the last few years. So while I have been doing that, I started up cutting out everything I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. So then the next thing I found is different colored paper, transparent paper, other paper. And, and because I'm so drawn to color, I always love going into a place like, I don't know, Planet Modulo or somewhere mm -hmm. where there's anything to do with different colors, paper. I mean, I go crazy. It's like being in a candy shop. Yeah. And so I had this paper, and of course, because I was cutting up everything, I was starting cutting out these shapes, but not knowing really what I'm going to do. And I don't know, one day I was experimenting and I thought, I want to photograph them. Not my photographs, you know, the, the cutouts for my own photographs, I put them aside. I just want to see what I can do with these cut out papers. So I love photographing objects or things in the bright sunlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, where I started that mise-en-scene in the trilogy was this thread before, yes, I was just documenting, seeing what is around me and composing my image. But again, here it was really the act of putting some, like to create a mise-en-scene. And I photographed the paper then in the bright, bright sunlight. I remember it was towards the end of the summer of 2018 that I started the cutouts. And I literally was amazed what was happening because the paper that I used was so thin and I wanted to arrange them in a certain way in the sunlight. And by the time, you know, I thought I had arranged and I take my camera, I realized everything was changing because it was like a chemical reaction. The strong heat of the sun made the paper act and interact mm -hmm. with each other. 
and it was fascinating. They, you know, they, 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 they were moving. It was like a performance of a dance performance. <laughs> and it was so fascinating to see. And I remember two years earlier, I was at the fair Art Basel to visit. And there was one artist, I think his name was Ariel Schlesinger. Mm -hmm. And he did an amazing installation of two white pieces of papers that were manipulated by an electronic system that he created. So you see at this installation, first there are these two white pieces of paper, and then slowly they act. It's it, it's quite fascinating how yeah, I remember seeing this. Oh, it was you the, saw it? At yeah, the Art that Basel? was the one time. I think it was in um, 2016. Yeah, in the in the space unlimited where exactly. they have the big projects. Oh, wonderful! So you know exactly what I'm it talking. It was amazing because just to think, it's two pieces of paper, but it was like a dance. It was like a dance, like a love making almost. Yeah, and... it was really yeah, exactly. It was a very intimate. Intimate performance, performance yeah. yes, and but, then you see how they're they're together, and then they separate. I mean, it it was fascinating. Yeah, no, I remember watching it for quite a while. Me a lot too. of people were just I, I so just, enthralled. Yes, I was just looking and looking at that, and so here I was, and it immediately it reminded me of that piece from mm -hmm. this artist, and I thought this is just magical because not only transformed the sun, the paper. But it allowed me to create these shapes with the shadow. So depending on how the sun was, depending from which angle and how I arranged, I had the most crazy shadows. And I started photographing that and I was really, it was like a hallucination because it was so interesting what was happening. And... um what followed then was a complete <laughs> obsession. So basically all of 19 and 20, I spent my days whenever, I mean, I could only obviously work when there was the bright, hot sunlight, even the winter light, the shadows were completely different. Mm -hmm. But when it was hot and I couldn't work outside because any wind would ruin it, I had to work inside. But when there was a strong sun, it felt like, creating work while being almost like in a sauna because yeah. it was so hot and it was like it was felt like acrobacy <laughs> but um i couldn't have anticipated what happened yeah. it, 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 i mean it sounds silly to say but the sun allowed me to do this project and uh, i just was there and i witnessed but not only i witnessed of course i also I arranged the mm -hmm. paper and yeah. the colors in a very particular way. Even just with the paper cutouts, I mean, you can create endless works. And what I also thought was interesting, because I did so many, you can also really fail and go wrong mm -hmm. in a very quick way. Either you really get it and you get something marvelous or it's really bad. I mean, it's a fine line on what happens and how you work with these very few elements. So it was really interesting to see when it worked and when it didn't work. Yeah. It reminds me of when you look at a lot of, um, not even the minimalist art before that, when you see, say, Kandinsky and Klee and those guys that were just trying to get a painting down to its core. Yeah. Minimum. And you think, Oh, it's so simple. They've just got a line and a line and a circle and a bit of color and that's it. But you move it to there and then it falls apart. Like there is this very delicate balance, I think, that when we look at it, it makes sense and it feels right. And then as soon as you shift the position, then it's gone. How is editing then? I spend hours editing. And it's the same what you just said. It's so true, not only for the cutouts, but also for the collage work. Because if you add too many elements, you can also kill mm. the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a fine line and so sensitive. And I would always say, again, even though I have to learn always, less is more. But I mean, you create a lot of work. It's not just that they come and, oops, mm -hmm. snap, you know, you take the picture, you got it. I mean, 
I, yeah, even just the cutouts, I worked on the series for a good two and a half years. Of course, I developed my other series in parallel, my work in progress, but the main focus was the cutouts. And uh, it just takes time because if you really are invested in your work, you also feel when it doesn't work and when you're about to fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have to be very critical and really know your work. So I spend a long time editing. And, you know, the cutouts, I would say, is not a very particular book project. It's more an exhibition yeah, project. Because do you need to cut down 300 to 190 to 94 pictures of cutouts? The way the book lends itself to narrative, to a story, essentially, abstract forms I mean, they, they're at home on the wall. It, a, it, they lend themselves more to be, yeah, exhibited. But because I love the bookmaking process so much, I really thought it would be great, even for that series, if it's more going to end up hopefully on the walls, mm -hmm. it still is great to have a book. But I also, from all the books that I made previously, I knew this would be the hardest to make mm. because... I still didn't know how to translate that work into a book form. And when I went to Leipzig to work with the designer, Hannah Feldmeier, I started working with her 10 years ago. Oh, okay. For One Still and Forever, she did with me Six Degrees of Freedom trilogy and, and now the cutouts. We knew that this would be very hard to translate. And we were start working on the sequence she has this beautiful like dark gray magnetic wall and we were you know placing the small prints and trying to look for adequate sequence and i don't know the normal bookmaking with white pages i thought i don't know it just doesn't work and because we were so obsessed with this magnetic wall then the two of us, we were thinking, well, maybe we can translate that into a book. And then I thought, but it makes sense because I was thinking of my childhood from the theater or if you are in a concert or in a cinema, you know, everything that is surrounding you, you're in the dark and what you see is either the stage or the screen. And then what is there has its place to be shown, but you really have the focus and I thought that maybe we find a way. And that's when we were starting evolving about having the dark pages and even a dark cover so that everything is more or less you are in the dark, but then the works, they really, they can start um, oh, okay. glowing. Yeah. But we also decided, I obviously wanted more cutouts mm -hmm. because the whole series consists of 100 works. Okay. But Hannah said, no, 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 no. You cannot show the whole series. You're going to bore people to, to death. I mean, who will? E e the, the cutouts, it has to be fresh and, and it can't be too many. So we literally cut out half. Oh. And in the book, there are only 50. Oh, but in the exhibition? Well, when do you have that luxury to show it <laughs> all the hundred pieces? That's the thing with exhibitions. You only get to see a small, I mean, but my fantasy, if ever one day, it would be marvelous to <laughs> see all the hundred, but I don't know if that will happen in my <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> but nevertheless, yeah, we only show half of the project in the book to keep it not to become redundant and mm -hmm. boring. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, the book has been out now, well, 10 days. And it's interesting to, to see the response because, again, you have no clue how, no idea how people are going to respond to a piece of work. And even though they are quite abstract and it's paper cutouts photographed against a colored background, it's amazing to see the reactions from the people who have gotten the book or mm -hmm. have seen some works maybe on social media. 
in the responses I've gotten, I'm really, I mean, I'm happy, but I'm also happily surprised that people feel so much emotion. I mean, they are abstract, but I've also gotten some of the feedback that they say, yes, it's abstract, but they have a poetry and they have their own emotion. And, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I can just say I'm, I'm very pleased because I, I feel this way. For me, they're very emotional. Mm-hmm. I, I, I fantasize. I create my own stories. I, I have, you know, I imagine things with these shapes and forms. And uh, they have a story for me. But it was very interesting because Robert said, when I showed him the project, he said, Jesse, it's the cutouts. If now you're going to come with titles <laughs> that are very, you know, poetic and romantic, he says, you're going to kill this project. Just, you know, keep it by the numbers, cut out one, cut out two, and then let people think and dream whatever they want. Yes, that's very that's And very I thought good it advice. was a great advice. Yeah. Because I'm more sometimes, I have the, even in the titles, my title, Six Degrees of Freedom, uh, I don't know, One Day in November. And Robert suggested, no, <laughs> cutouts. I was like, okay, it's a change, but yeah. yes, I, it makes sense. It, it, it creates um, a tension and it's, it's good. Yeah, it's, I think it also gives people the space to project what they want. But then well, they have the freedom, they can think yeah. and do whatever they want. And that's the beauty about it. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about abstract work. Everybody, whenever you see a, I don't know, a theater play, a work of art, piece of music, the beauty is that each one of us, we bring ourselves to what we are seeing and everybody has different emotions and feelings and even sometimes depending on the day on our mood we have different opinions on what we're seeing yeah it, it's interesting how we how we respond or how we go into a dialogue with what is happening in front of our eyes absolutely particularly if it's abstract because there's nothing concrete that you can say this is a cup or a candle holder they're just forms and shapes and colors. And depending on, yeah, your internal mood, you can read into it any number of ways. Exactly. But I still believe everything is there. Because even colors, colors have their own proper emotions. I mean, ask people about their favorite colors or, you know, how they react. It's so powerful how we all react to color. I mean, it's... And I don't know, colors, yeah, colors are emotions in itself. I, um, As you can see here, this, this blue wall, I mean, you know, I love having things on the wall, but that wall, I figured, no, I'm just <laughs> going to leave it blue <laughs> because it has such a powerful emotion. It does, yeah. yeah it really has a, it has a presence. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the cutouts. I'm I'm actually quite curious what journey the cutouts will make. And while I was telling you all this, you know, sometimes we seem to forget and I realized how grateful I am about the whole journey mm-hmm. I did so far. With the ups and downs and with everything, but in a way how I feel lucky and uh, yeah, grateful to be able to live that life that I'm living. Yeah. It's, um, I feel it's a privilege, even with the struggle, you know, because we all struggle. Mm -hmm. We all have our own doubts and um, question and wondering where the the road is taking us, where we want to go. But, yeah, it's telling you about my past and the different steps in my in my life, in my work, I realized how yeah, how I'm really thankful for for everything that happened. And 
that also means the struggle because maybe on the outside, sometimes people think, oh, it's all so easy and it just comes and it's handed to you. But the truth is nothing is handed. You know, you have mm-hmm. to work really hard on everything, on your work, on how you interact. I mean, how the the, the work relationships you have, you know, it, nothing is easy. No. I mean, it, it seems easy, but it's it's hard work. And you never can take things for granted. No. And I think it's, you're lucky if you have that good fortune of the copyright presentation and, oh, I get to meet Giselle Freund or that you were assisting David LaChapelle and he said, come to come to New York. I can't promise anything, but, you know, if you want to make mm. it, this is what you've got to do. And just it, so many things you realize depend on being in the right place at the right time. You think yeah. if I was sick that day or if I didn't turn up that day or someone had to fill in for me, yeah. Yeah. this wouldn't have happened. I would have no. gone on a completely different path. And having just those those kind of pivotal moments that happen, yeah. you think so much relies on that. And even thinking about your time in Frankfurt and the five days at the fair, if you got to 40 and thought, oh, I'll just go home, it's Sunday lunchtime or it's Saturday afternoon, I'm exhausted. I I can't do any more. But the, you went to all forty eight of the interviews, and it was the la- literally the last one on the Sunday. Yeah, and that was the one that changed everything. Yeah, like to not give up. I think like having that perseverance. It's the perseverance. I mean, and I think, like I told you earlier, if I wouldn't have this passion deep down inside me. I would have quit a few times Mm -hmm. because it's just really damn hard to make a living. Anything creative, let it musicians, actors, painters, sculpt. I mean, composers. It's it's all hard and challenging. But if you really love what you're doing, I mean, you you just it's what you choose. You you make it work somehow. It's like it's just this necessity that you have to do it and and of course you have to prioritize and certain things that other people do you can't do because you know you're focused on that or you have to invest in that and mm-hmm. but if you kind of if you um, somehow are able or managing to to make a living with what you love doing it's already a huge privilege and Absolutely, um yeah. And if you can pay your rent with what you love doing and your bills, I mean, it's that that is um, a big, big chance. And um, and you, I mean, it's it's a roller coaster, you know, like good times and bad times, and yeah. But it's all part of it. You just gotta really have a passion and and stick to it and. Just don't give up, like you said. Yeah. And I think as well, you kind of cherish the good things more when you know how much you've struggled yes, to get to them. To get there. <laughs> yes, that's true. I hope you enjoyed hearing Jessica's story. I know for me, it was really inspiring to hear more about her journey. I mentioned Paris Photo at the beginning of the program. So if you're in Paris this week, there is a good chance you'll be able to meet Jessica at some stage. Select cutouts will be presented by Robert Moore at Gallery at the Fair itself. The photo book of cutouts has been shortlisted for the Paris Photo Aperture Photo Book Award, so you'll be able to see it there. And LEX Paris Photo, which began in 2018 as an initiative to increase the visibility of women photographers, this year curated by Natalie Hashdorfer, has included Jessica's work in her look at 170 years of photography history. As always, there are links in the show notes to the most things we spoke about, in addition to Jessica's social media and the aforementioned upcoming events. However, if you do have any questions or would like to know more about this episode or those prior, you're very welcome to get in touch. That's all for now. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to the podcast. Thanks again for tuning in. My name's Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.